video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Hi, my name is Christina Hopkins. My work is in environmental health and infectious disease. And I'm a research manager at Ofsted & Associates, which is a company that specializes in conducting real world research in order to support improvements in patient safety and occupational health. Now, I'm here today to talk about a new evidence that calls into question a common practice of using alcohol flushes to aid in drying endoscope channels, as is recommended by several scope manufacturers as well as guideline issuing bodies. Whether or not the last cycle in the AER flushes alcohol through the channels to aid in drying, endoscopes that have undergone high level disinfection are soaking wet when they come out of the AER. And they're often wiped down with towels in, or low linting cloths in order to dry the outsides. But what about the insides? Well, there's a few different methods in the field, one of which being air purges in the AER itself. And another thing that people might do is actually hook their endoscopes up to forced air drying stations like the ones pictured here. And these use the, air, uh, the facility's air supply or commercial drying in order to apply forced air to the channels. Now, scopes might be stored in either traditional cabinets where they are either passively ventilated or ventilated actively by circulating filtered air around the endoscopes. And they might also be stored in endoscope drying cabinets, which not only circulate filtered air around the endoscopes, but also through the endoscope channels. However, when we've looked at scopes and when others have looked at scopes in the field, we find that over 50% have residual moisture. And we're not talking just a drop or two here or there. We're talking about really, really wet scopes. And this is important because endoscope manufacturers have asserted that residual moisture in endoscope channels can foster the growth of bacteria, including things like waterborne pathogens. And a recent study out of UCLA actually just showed this. So they found that a waterborne pathogen called Pseudomonas replicated rapidly inside wet scopes. And the number of bacterial colonies actually increased by more than a million per hour when wet scopes were stored in standard, drying ca or standard storage cabinets. On the other hand, drying out the germs had the opposite effect. And when the scopes were stored in a special drying cabinet, the number of germs actually decreased. Now the risk to patients here isn't theoretical. Pathogens have been transmitted from scopes to patients due to microbes being left over after HLD from drying practices and even from contaminated AER rinse water. Now, isn't that crazy? Infections related to rinse water are especially unfortunate because the techs could do everything right every step along the way and unbeknownst to them, the scopes were recontaminated in the final rinse. And so that leads us to the topic of this video, which is alcohol flushes of endoscope channels after HLD. Now, theoretically, alcohol was thought to inhibit the growth of microbes and to facilitate endoscope drying, which kind of delivers this one-two punch to any microbes that have made it through HLD or been introduced by rinse water. Now, alcohol flushes during drying have been the subject of two new studies. So let's take a look at some of the recent evidence that is shedding light on some of these assumptions. So let's start with microbial contamination. So I remember that I used to use alcohol to wipe down my lab bench when I worked in biology labs. And we use alcohol-based hand sanitizer on our hands all of the time. So it doesn't seem like a stretch that alcohol could kill microbes on medical instruments and devices. And there's one study that actually tested this by intentionally contaminating segments of air water channels with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they found that 30 to 70% isopropyl alcohol wiped the germs out. Now, this sounds great, but it's important to note that these endoscope channel segments were pristine. There was only one type of bug that was used, and there was no soil or damage, and all of these don't represent real-world conditions. And once we leave the lab for the real world, things start to fall apart. Study after study shows that there are a lot of bugs left in scopes after HLD and after alcohol flushing. And when we've looked at scopes, we see all kinds of bacteria and super concerningly, big fluffy spots of mold. Now this culture actually came from samples from a bronchoscope. So mold and pathogens in a scope that goes into a, pa a patient lung, that's pretty bad news. And while we've seen microbes in more than half of patient ready scopes in our studies, even when alcohol flushes are used, others have found that upwards of three quarters of their scopes have microbes. So what's going on? 
Well, you could argue that this isn't a fair test of alcohol, right? These scopes could be damaged or dirty, or the people might not be, text might not be doing the right steps, but that's really the point, isn't it? Alcohol doesn't eliminate microbes under real world conditions, so we shouldn't rely on it to do so. Okay, but what about drying? The thought here was that the alcohol evaporates quickly, so we could use it to flush the water out of the scope, and then the alcohol would just evaporate away. And a recent study actually put this to the test by timing how long it took scope channels to dry using forced air after being flushed with various concentrations of alcohol. When we mapped their findings on this clock, it took about nine minutes for the scope channels to dry when they were flushed with plain water. And this aligns with current recommendations to use 10 minutes of forced air to dry endoscope channels. Now, when they flushed with 30% alcohol first, it took about 14 minutes to dry the channels. But wait, longer? And 50% took even longer, more than doubling the time required to dry the channels when no alcohol was used at all. And finally, when we get to 70%, which is what's recommended by guidelines, it took more than three times longer to dry the channels than if no alcohol were used. And another study found that small channels don't get dry at all. In this study, researchers assessed the dryness of the suction biopsy and air water channels after a 70% alcohol flush and an air purge in the AER. Okay, so after three minutes of air purging, both the SB and the air water channels were still wet. But after seven days of storage, the SB channel was dry, but the air water channel still wet. Now, 10 minutes of air was applied after an alcohol flush, and that got the SB channel dry, but the air water channel was still wet. And the air water channel stayed wet even after seven days of hanging vertically. So what the heck's going on? So let's revisit the alcohol hand rub or the alcohol wipes from my bench tops. When alcohol is spread thin across a surface that has a lot of contact with air, it evaporates really quickly. Now the authors in our clock study a few slides ago noted that at higher alcohol concentrations, the alcohol in the channels tended to just spread out along the channel and then clump back up into droplets once the forced air stopped. Water, on the other hand, just spritz right out the end. And now as you're imagining this, think about a glass of wine. When you swirl a glass of wine, you can see the wine spread out on the sides of the glass. The mixture behaves just a little bit differently than just water. And when the alcohol evaporates, it leaves the water behind to fall back into the glass and leave the legs that you can see at the end of this video. So eliminating microbes is a bit of a bust. Drying scopes faster was a bit of a bust. But what else do we know about alcohol? Well, alcohol flushes can actually make it harder to clean the instruments because alcohol is a protein fixative. So what does that mean? Well, it means that your scopes could end up looking like these. Now, all of these scopes were from a site that did manual cleaning, HLD, alcohol flushes, all by the book but their scopes still had brown stuff in them that they couldn't get out regardless of how many times they cleaned it. And another issue with alcohol is that it's just not a good thing to be around. You know, and I think we tend to downplay occupational exposure to things like isopropyl alcohol because we're exposed to alcohol all the time. And frankly, in the grand scheme of other super hazardous chemicals and nasty exposures that we encounter in sterile processing units, alcohol seems kind of tame, but Alcohol is still a strong chemical, especially when used in large volumes like for flushing endoscopes, and it has its own safety issues. So we've heard from sterile processing techs that it has a really strong, unpleasant odor, and I know we've walked into a few units where our eyes and nose immediately started to burn. It can cause drowsiness, dizziness, and nausea, and on top of all of that, it's highly flammable. Okay, so what do the standards and guidelines say after all this? Well, European guidelines largely recommend against using alcohol because of the protein fixation issue and because it doesn't really seem to help drying much. In the US, guidance is mostly fairly non-committal. Multi-society says that the evidence doesn't strongly support the use or refute the use of alcohol, and Amy and AORN both recommend conducting a multidisciplinary risk assessment in order to determine what policies in this area should be. Now, finally, SGNA's guideline says that alcohol must be used before drying channels, stating that it assists with evaporation. So where does that leave you? It leaves me thinking we need to revisit the evidence, 
based for our recommendations <clears throat> around alcohol flushes of endoscope channels, because right now, it doesn't seem like the evidence really supports the use of alcohol in endoscope drying. Now to summarize the pros and cons based on the evidence we showed today, on the pro side, we have that it may be able to reduce microbial contamination in endoscope channels under pristine lab conditions, but it doesn't really seem to bear out under real world conditions. And that's pretty much it for the plus side. On the con side, staff don't like it and it's not good for you. So that's a big, a big negative. There's an extra cost burden associated with having to buy the alcohol. It can actually make your scopes harder to clean and it can really glue down any residual soil that might be left in your scope after HLD. And finally, it actually makes drying take longer than not flushing with alcohol at all. Not only that, but effective drying with forced air can also reduce microbial contamination on its own, and that further undercuts any real positives that alcohol might bring to the table for this. So if we're trying to make decisions based on evidence, it seems like we really need more real world research to support finding what really gets our ports and channels dry in order to really base our recommendations in um, what's true in the real world. This video summarizes the evidence on alcohol flushing during endoscope drying. If you're interested in learning more, we have a free one hour continuing education webinar available on our educational portal. You may also be interested in our other YouTube videos on endoscope drying or in several relevant papers on the topic, all of which are linked in the video description. Here's a list of references if you would like to read further. And for more information, visit our website or contact us by email at education at offsetinsights.com. This webinar was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Healthmark provided our team with financial support and clinical insights related to the development of this video in the associated webinar. Please contact Healthmark directly for information about their products and educational services at www.hmark.com. Here's a list of disclaimers that you should read before making any changes to policies or practices at your facility.